My task is to visit with you about the guidelines. My disclosures are here. I have no relationships with industry. I am going to go through the information that would have set context and begin here. Beginning two iterations of the guidelines ago in 2003 under the direction of Dr. Hunt, that guideline was published in 2005 and then later again for the 2009 iteration of the guideline that was under the direction of Dr. Jessup, we began incorporating this notion of the stages of heart failure. Let me remind you that this progresses from your left to your right. There are two stages, stage A and B, that are pre-heart failure. And then there are stages C and D, which represent symptomatic heart failure, that is, having ever had symptoms or having refractory symptoms. This is by way of review for most of you, but it's also by way of emphasis. Remember, this guideline paradigm didn't begin until 1995, and we've since refined and increased our embrace of the guideline and developed this framework over the last couple of decades. What you now see before you shows the layout of the guideline structure that populates our thought process going forward. That is to say, we identify the candidate patients that fall in each of the stages. And then we identify those therapeutic interventions that really are most notable and are most likely to change the natural history. The guideline variation I'm showing you now is from 2013. And what was notably different for this statement from 2005 and again 2009 was that we bifurcated stage C and made evident that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction now has become a very important component of how we think about generating guidelines and how we think about advising the practicing community in the care of patients with this disease. Now, in response to our own constituency, we were advised that our prior iterations of guidelines had been very expansive, nearly encyclopedic, but unfortunately were not very practical, not usable. And so the response was to develop tools that would make them more accessible. So we developed this very straightforward algorithm that really tried to make clear what kind of directives needed to go to the community to orchestrate therapy for patients with reduced ejection fraction heart failure. That group begins at the top of the tier. And then there is a very strong prop with an incredible level of evidence that says it is a class of recommendation one, which means it should be considered, for all patients with reduced ejection fraction heart failure to be on RAS inhibition, either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, not the two together, and an evidence-based beta blocker. And then we created three options. These options are not mutually exclusive. For the patient with persistent volume overload, we made clear that diuretics were appropriate, although the level of evidence is C. We indicated that for the African-American patient with persistent symptoms, there is a class of recommendation one to add hydralazine and isosobutanitrate. And then for patients with reasonable renal function, we said there is a class of recommendation one to add the aldosterone antagonist. And that was a state of the art just as we knew it in 2013. We speak with such conviction about this algorithmic approach because the data that are available have indicated to us that the benefit of these interventions is not trivial. This separate analysis published in 2012 makes clear that the number needed to treat when normalized for 36-month outcomes approximates single-digit numbers, meaning that the impact of these therapies is quite considerable. But after this time frame, things changed. Things changed because of a noteworthy landmark study, the Paradigm HF trial. What is remarkable about this trial, independent of the actual outcome, what is remarkable, and this is in the context of the commentary you just heard from Dr. Jessup, is that this trial challenged the cornerstone therapies in heart failure. It challenged the primacy of the ACE inhibitor, which we all embrace as really the most fundamental component of a treatment strategy. And it introduced to us, and this is the part that I embrace so fervently, it introduced to us a license to continue to challenge conventional wisdom 
and seek out therapies instead of, not simply in addition to, predicate therapies. Yes, the results are compelling and persuasive, and many of, many of, many of us have seen these data several times over. It does have a remind us to go back in time and think about why we are at a point where we can speak with such conviction about the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It wasn't because we were targeting hemodynamic parameters or even targeting the ejection fraction, as you've heard. It's because the right amount of work was done, the might, right amount of research was done to really elucidate what we think are pertinent mechanisms of disease, specifically activation of the RAS system. What is most notable about the cascade you see in front of you is that the end result of the elaboration of angiotensin II and its interface with the angiotensin II type 1 receptor is a portfolio of biological actions that leads to adverse changes within the substrate, that is the left ventricle, whether it's fibrosis, hypertrophy, an increase in oxidative stress, or an increase in the release of the sympathetic nervous system activity, all of this comes in concert to lead to progressive changes in the substrate. Now, as we recognize this incredibly important pathophysiology, which really has enabled us to develop strategies to improve outcomes in heart failure, we also now must incorporate a parallel mechanism that also has been discovered through diligent research. We've identified that the natriuretic peptide system is in fact incredibly important in the homeostasis of our cardiovascular profile. Specifically, as the natriuretic peptides interface with their relevant receptors, that is in fact a mechanism that upregulates the activity of cyclic GMP. When cyclic GMP activity is upregulated, we see the production of protein kinase G. You saw that previously in the algorithm that Dr. Jessup shared with you describing the pathophysiology that we believe to be relevant now for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The subsequent biological activities after the elaboration of protein kinase G are those activities which in large measure are antithetical to the activities we see when angiotensin II is elaborated. Thus, this provided a unique opportunity to develop a therapeutic target that on the one hand endorse the necessity for RAS inhibition, but on the other hand modulated and upregulated the presence of endogenous natriuretic peptides. And this combination biology was in the substance for the drug previously known as LCZ696, but now known as Valsartan Secubitril. I won't go through the original results from Paradigm HF because they've been vetted sufficiently well enough, but there are new data that have endorsed the rationale that the guideline writing committee used to embrace these findings as seminal and to represent them in a very high order in our guidelines. Let me start with these data published in just December of this year that are demonstrable of the interface between the biomarker profile and the use of what we call the RNA compound. What I'd like for you to do is to train your attention to panels B and panels C. They look at the change in biomarkers after introduction of either the ACE inhibitor based regimen or the RNA based regimen. What's noteworthy is that if one looks in panel B after the introduction of the RNA regimen, what you will identify in the red line is that there is a reduction in the natriuretic peptide level, in this case NT pro BMP which is consistent with the therapeutic response. If you now look in panel C and identify what happens after the introduction of the RNA compound, this panel identifies the response to BNP. And you can see that regardless of the clinical expression, there is an increase in the BNP. So there's an important message to the practitioner that when using the RNA compounds, the NT pro BMP is the preferred biomarker for assay if one is trying to assess how the patient is doing and also to avoid the mistake that may happen if you inadvertently follow the BNP and use that for any clinical reason in decision making. But I share this with you because the next set of data points we find to be incredibly important. These data points 
demonstrated that when one follows the NT Pro BNP longitudinally, there is evidence, regardless of the treatment assignment, whether it is for the ACE inhibitor based arm or the ARNI based arm, that for those patients who are able to achieve an NT Pro BNP less than 1,000, their outcomes are uniquely better than those patients in whom the NT Pro BNP remains greater than 1,000. And so this further validates the benefit of not only taking this very novel approach, but understanding how these biomarkers so intricately play within our assessment of how patients are doing. I think for the next graphic, if we could turn the lights in the auditorium down, it will be most appreciated. While we wait to see if the lights can be adjusted, let me again talk you through this graphic, because again, it is illustrative of new information that endorses the way the guideline committee approached the data. Specifically, for those patients that began with a high biomarker threshold, and over the course of the study, regardless of treatment assignment, remained with a high threshold, their outcomes were less good compared to the patients, who I think you can see now, who started high and went to low. So again, another take home message for the practitioner that as we begin to understand more information coming forward from this data set, we have more reason to embrace the benefit of incorporating the ARNI therapy in the treatment regimen in appropriate patients with reduced ejection fraction heart failure. The next thing to share with you that further endorses the incorporation of the ARNI therapies in the guidelines for the treatment of reduced ejection fraction heart failure is to recognize that there was a unique benefit observed, not simply on death due to pump failure, but death due to sudden cardiac events. Let me change your attention now to another parameter that's very important, and that's heart rate. These data make clear that in the setting of heart failure, an elevated heart rate is a risk factor for less good outcomes. It, in fact, has been the development of evabridine that has revealed to us that we can modulate that risk by using a drug that selectively slows heart rate. Evabridine targets what we refer to now as the HCN channels, channels that are found only in the SA node and in the retina. In the SA node, their only functionality is to impact diastolic repolarization. This slowing phenomenon leads only to heart rate slowing when it happens in the eye, it causes phosphanes, and that is, in fact, part of the side effect profile. But importantly, the available data demonstrated that a composite endpoint was improved, but within this composite of hospitalization and cardiovascular death, it, in fact, was hospitalization for heart failure that improved the most. We know, however, though, that in those patients on target dose beta blockers, we didn't see this effect. So for patients who are unable to be on target dose beta blockers and have a persistent increase in heart rate, we believe that there is a benefit with the addition of evabridine to a regimen that includes beta blockers in those that are in sinus rhythm. So this is a pause moment. If you aggregate all of the landmark trials done in heart failure that target the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, you see a wealth of evidence that really and appropriately populates a guideline statement. So earlier in 2016, we came up with the focus update of the 2013 guideline. It's appropriate to acknowledge my vice chair, Dr. Jessup, and all of the members of the committee that contributed to the development of this guideline statement. In this statement, there were several differences unique from the previous guideline. The first is that we incorporated the RNA compound as a means of RAS inhibition consistent with ACE or ARB proven to modulate the natural history of heart failure. Secondly, we specifically said that it is recommended that in selected patients the ARNI can be given in lieu of the ACE inhibitor for the additive benefits seen in the Paradigm HF trial. And then third, we indicated that it is reasonable to consider Vabridine in the patient with a persistent increase in heart rate already on evidence-based therapy, including beta blockers. This is what those statements look like. 
the first effort was to make certain that RAS inhibition is the most important thing. And there are three ways that we can get to RAS inhibition. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and ACE intolerant patients are the ionic compounds. We then made clear that it is appropriate, it is appropriate to substitute the ionic compound for the ACE inhibitor, but in selected patients, specifically those with a durable blood pressure, we believe those with either class two or three heart failure, not class four heart failure, especially in those that have no history of angioedema. This is the patient profile that we believe characterizes the benefits seen in the Paradigm HF trial. We were very careful to point out the potential risk of hypotension and especially the risk of angioedema, making it a class three recommendation to concomitantly administer the RNA compound with an ACE inhibitor requiring a 36-hour washout. And then finally, with Vabradine, we made evident that there is a reasonable recommendation to add it for the reasons that I've described. And so this is where we are now. The original algorithm I shared with you, but one that now is populated with additional drugs, with many strategies that will improve outcomes, and with at least three devices. So it is clear that the treatment of heart failure has necessarily become more complex and I would argue that's a good thing because it means we have more choices and we can be more selective in therapy, but we have to be more diligent in our decisions about how we treat our patients. Let me close with several very important points. The first is this. For the first time, there was an alignment of the ESC, the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, and the Heart Failure Society of America to endorse this most recent update primarily because of the magnitude of benefit that would be realized in the entire global heart fellow community with promulgation of these new guideline statements. To put further emphasis on this, there was an important paper that was written by then the presidents of all of the relevant organizations. And what I will need to do for you is to read a statement from that manuscript. It reads thusly, the offices of the ACC, AHA, and ESC, as well as the HFSA, and their respective guideline oversight committees meet regularly to discuss opportunities for coordination and alignment on overlapping topics and evolution of the methodology used to gather and evaluate scientific evidence. The objective is to promote optimal care for patients with all forms of cardiovascular disease to improve outcomes and enhance quality of life around the world the new documents represent an important step in this direction. So once again, we've expressed a willingness to do things differently, to come together for the good of all the patients that we see. I'll close with this. These are the next steps that we intend to take. There is a second iteration of this focus update that should be out shortly. It will uniquely highlight information on prevention, updates on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and important heart failure comorbidities for which we have new evidence, specifically anemia, sleep apnea, and hypertension. There is a second document that is nearly complete, which is the ACC Heart Failure Clinical Pathways. It is intended to answer practical questions to make it easier for the practitioner to utilize the evidence and the guidelines as written. And there's a third activity that has just begun by the college to develop a guidelines toolkit, and that too is intended to develop app-friendly and web-based tools that will facilitate the best implementation of these evidence-based guidelines. Thank you very much for your attention.